All right, next up we have Sean Reif, who's gonna talk about S-Cite, identifying highly replicated research through citation analysis. Oh uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, so uh, real quick, uh, my name is Sean, I'm from uh, Cite.ai and Murray State University in Kentucky, where I'm an associate professor of psychology. And uh, before I get started, I just wanted to note a couple of things that I should have put on the first slide and I, I forgot. Uh, this work has been supported in part by the NSF and NIH. And second, um, I'm one of the co-founders of Site.ai. So um, I have shares in Site.ai and I obviously have a financial, in financial interest in the company. So full disclosure. Um, Site was founded in 2018. We started it to address two key challenges. Uh, one is simply the volume and velocity of uh, published research. So, uh, you know, simply the millions of papers published every year, uh, as well as the extent to which sort of the state of the art or the accepted stance on any given topic changes quickly, uh, combined with the credibility or replication crisis. Uh, and what we really wanted to do was to enable researchers to evaluate research in terms of quality. Um, and also to discover high quality and ideally replicable uh, research. And uh, the thing that we sort of leaned on to do this is citation statements. That is the key component. So a citation statement is basically just what you see in the gray box up there, is the text that surrounds the citation to a scientific paper. So uh, we do this, uh, you know, if you want to actually analyze the content of scientific citations, you have to have the full text of the scientific article. And uh, so we have to get those and we have to uh, actually analyze them. So real quick, I'm just going to talk about sort of our, our methodology and how that works. If you want more information and want some, some of the technical details, I have a, a QR code and a link to a, excuse me, to a paper, open access paper, where we describe it in a, in a good bit more detail. Uh, so we retrieve papers from open access postings. We have a partnership with our research, the folks behind Unpaywall. And uh, we also have indexing agreements with uh, many major publishers. So they send us both their back catalogs as well as an ongoing deposit of new publications. We then extract the text from either the PDF or XML files that we are either sent or retrieve through one of those methods. And uh, we have some methods of identifying the text of citations, uh, such as the examples that I, I gave just a second ago. Uh, we store those in a database, and then we have a, a deep learning classifier that classifies that citation text as uh, one of three categories, supporting, uh, that is to say, we successfully replicated FISB et al., uh, contrasting, we did not find evidence consistent with FISB et al., or simply mentioning, uh, which is, you know, where you cite something but not in a sort of evaluative context or, or you know, relevant way. Uh, so as of uh, today, we've uh, indexed a total of 34.1 million scientific papers and extracted 1.9 billion uh, citations from them, and uh, our database currently uh, covers 179 million works. And just to clarify, uh, if you're looking at that and it seems like there's a discrepancy in the numbers, um, our database contains metadata on basically everything with the DOI. Uh, what we do is we, we add to that by analyzing the scientific papers themselves and extracting that citation data, as well as enriching it with other sources like OpenAlex, which I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Okay, so we combine all of this and this uh, allows us to produce what we call report pages for a given uh, scientific work. So this is an example paper on amygdala hyperactivity, uh, Fawn et al. from 2006. And uh, with these report pages, which you can, can pull up for any published work with the DOI, it will uh, give you some metadata, it'll give you some information about the publication, but what makes Cite a good bit different is uh, what's in the right-hand panel there under the cited by 449 publications. Uh, that is containing text that is not from this paper, not from Fawn at all. It's actually from other papers that are citing this paper. Uh, so if we zoom in, you can see uh, this one example from Davies et al. from 2017. And uh, it's got a total of four what we call smart citations. Um, the first two are listed up there, and it's showing you the full text of the uh, citation statement. 
Uh, now, because we have uh, the classifier and we've been able to classify these uh, citations, um, we're also able to uh, allow users to filter uh, that list of citation statements by category. Um, so for any of these reports, you can say, hey, only show me the supporting or mentioning or contrasting citations. And uh, that ability to filter or sort by the types of citations that a work has received um, leads to some interesting possibilities. Uh, so for one thing, we have a, a pretty robust search infrastructure. So you can search for papers based on keywords like you would be able to with, with any other platform. Um, but because we have classified those citations, um, you can, for example, uh, filter the search results by the types of citations that a work has received. So, uh, for example, if you pull up the filter button uh, on the search page, you can, in this example, only display search results uh, from papers that have received 26 or more supporting citations. And ideally, um, you know, this is work that has been, at least to some extent, replicated later on. So um, there are a number of use cases. Um, obviously, orienting yourself or evaluating a, a new field is, is one of them. Um, so forward and backward chaining of citations, uh, if you're familiar with that process, it makes that fairly, fairly easy. Um, and I should say, so as a professor, every once in a while, I will teach intro psychology, which means I'm a social psychologist spending a week talking about neuroscience, which is mildly terrifying, um, even after doing it for years. Um, so, you know, one thing that I do is, is when I, I go back to sort of reprep my materials, I'll go through there and I'll say, uh, you know, all right, what are some of the key studies that are being cited in the latest edition of the text? And I'll, I'll look up what uh, citations they have received since then. Um, and I do that with a lot of classes, and it's, it's, it's a useful exercise. Um, you can also use this to identify what we call heavily active areas of research. So uh, if you're interested, say, in something where there's a lot of discussion going on, a paper or a topic, um, well, what we recommend is you can actually just look for, uh, look for papers or topics that have a relatively high number of both supporting and contrasting citations, uh, particularly if those have co-occurred within, you know, say, the past two or three years. Um, that's a pretty good indication that there's a lot of movement in that area. And uh, I think, you know, you can also see how this could have implications for things like grant writing, um, in terms of identifying sort of gaps in the literature or unresolved questions. But um, also, and then hopefully this is of interest to some of y'all, uh, I think there are applications for meta-scientific research. So we're, uh, we're very happy to collaborate with meta-scientists, researchers like yourselves, um, provide data, um, usually for free. Uh, and so, you know, one thing you can do with this is you can uh, use, for example, supporting citations as a kind of proxy for quality. Not a perfect proxy, it's a proxy, um, but some indication of the quality of scientific research. And um, in fact, I just had a graduate student, Hillary Copeland, who had just, uh, she just finished her analyses uh, doing exa exactly this. She's um, looking at uh, racial, ethnic, and gender diversity of authors and its impact on uh, si quality of scientific output uh, using that supporting citation count as uh, one indicator, one outcome variable. And you can also do things like identify various citation patterns. Um, so. There are a few implications for this, and um, here's where I get to talk about metrics, which I know is a favorite. Uh, everyone here loves metrics, right? Metrics are amazing, and we should have more of them. Um, I am not a fan of metrics, but I have resigned after a number of years to the fact that they will continue to exist uh, much as I dislike them. Um, and I, the thing that I, I like to point out uh, about metrics and the way that site does metrics, because we have... Um, what we call the site index, which is basically just a ratio of the supporting sites that a given journal or organization has received um, to the number of supporting and contrasting sites. Um, you know, this is, I think, a step up. It is a better metric, so it's a better bad thing, um, if you want to think about it that way, and that it's, it's based on the content of a citation, uh, not simply the fact that a citation has occurred. Um, and I think that is at least a step in the right direction. Um, I should also point out that we don't apply this, while we apply it to journals and organizations and funders, we don't apply it to authors or labs. Um, I believe the technical reason is because we feel like that would be icky. Um, 
so that's, you know, we have to draw the line there and then make sure that, you know, we're sort of uh, applying it with uh, good intentions. And uh, I was just at the large language, uh, uh, large language models uh, discussion earlier this morning. A lot of great discussion in there. Um, you can't give a talk without this kind of thing without sort of touching on AI, and that is definitely a thing that we are heavily invested in. Um, I'll go ahead and just say, if you were in that session, I remember one thing that people uh, were talking about was, you know, the problem of the sort of uh, open AI hallucinating. Um, you're familiar with that. It makes up references. It says things that aren't true. We've actually deployed, using OpenAI's uh, uh, back-end technology, we've deployed what we call Site Assistant. Um, and because we have access to the full text of scientific articles, we're able to parse questions that are posed in natural language and then give a composed synthetic answer, but one that's based on the scientific research. So if you go to that and type in a question, it will reply with a, an answer, but it will also give you, it will show you its work, it will show you what papers it's referencing. Um, so that's an active development and we're, we're excited about being able to work on that in the future. Uh, this is the link to the paper where I get into, we get into more technical detail about what we do and how we do it. And um, I, like I said, I'm, we're really excited about collaborating with MetaScience researchers. So if you're interested in any of that, by all means, please shoot me an email and uh, look forward to questions. I think we have time for just one question, so please. All right, I'll try to make it good. Thanks, Sean, for a great talk. Uh, Jordan Workin, Federation of American Scientists. So in the spirit of some of the discussion that has been happening around kind of other contributions to scientific progress, like data sets and tools and methodologies, I'm curious how Site thinks about kind of a fourth citation category that's more along the lines of using, um, and whether that would fall into supporting already or whether there's a, a different uh, angle on that. Yeah, so this is a great question. Um, we, we spent a lot of time developing those three categories. Um, and properly conceived, the way I understand your question, I, I think that would actually be what we would call mentioning citation. So it wouldn't be valenced. There's we've had plenty of debate over that. Um, but yeah, that is something that we're constantly exploring. And um, you know, I, I'd be come find me after, and we'll have a chat about it. Sounds good. So, thank you. <laughs>